Imagine if I asked you to give up just 30 minutes of your day in return for a magic pill. Now, this magic pill would help you to reduce your anxiety and stress, to improve your mood and motivation, but not only that, it would increase your ability to learn and to activate the best cognitive performance of your brain. It would help you to become more creative and more innovative. Now, not only that, this pill would be free and it would have no negative side effects. Now, taking all that into account, would you take me up on this offer? Now, the thing is that this pill is not a drug at all because all the benefits that I've just been describing to you can come by doing aerobic exercise. Stuff like jogging and swimming and, of course, cycling. However, when most of us think about aerobic exercise, what we tend to focus on are benefits like, like weight loss and you know, having a healthy heart. You know, we want to look slim for the beach. However, for knowledge workers like you and I, perhaps the biggest benefits of exercise actually occur in the brain. And that's what I want to explain to you today. Now, the stuff that I'm going to be sharing with you actually is based upon decades of research. Because what we need to do is we need to go back in history and to understand that the brains that we have today actually evolved millennia ago. And of course, millennia ago, ago human beings, we weren't working in offices and, and, and on computers. We were hunter-gatherers. And in fact, we were a special kind of creature because we engaged in what was called persistence hunting. Now, what is persistence hunting? It's very special because we're not as fast or as agile as something like a gazelle. So you imagine we would be out there in the savannah hunting with our buddies. We'd be chasing after that gazelle. But the gazelle can run much faster than us, so we lose sight of it. It disappears. So what do we have to do now? We have to stop and think. We have to use not just our physical endurance ability, we have to use our brain power. So what actually happens here is chemical. When we stop to think about where has that gazelle gone, we have to think about our past experiences. Which way did the gazelle go in the past? We, we might have to think about creative options to corner the gazelle, and of course we have to do that while communicating with others. Now, not only that, we might also have to be being aware that while chasing after that gazelle, something might be chasing after us a lion, a tiger that wants to eat us. So what happens actually is that this all comes together. And this is what the neuroscientists have started to understand, that when we actually move, we engage in cognition and we actually empower our brain to become more creative. Now, what does that mean in a chemical sense? It's very special because what the neuroscience research has revealed is that when we move, and particularly when we're in this aerobic exercise mode, our body releases some very important chemicals. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole mix, the whole cocktail of chemicals that are released, but there's two very important ones. You see, because when we engage in aerobic exercise, our body starts to release a chemical called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And what does BDNF do? It encourages the health and the growth and the differentiation of neurons and synapses. It even grows new brain cells. Now, when we do aerobic exercise, the research has shown that the BDNF in our blood can increase by more than 30%. And as knowledge workers, that's a big wow. But not only do we get BDNF, we also get a chemical called do dopamine, which many of you are familiar with as a reward chemical. But when that dopamine gets released, bow. Because what happens then is it not only boosts our cognition, because it's a neurotransmitter. It actually it transports those little signals across the synapses in the brain. By having more of that, more of those signals can be communicated. But not only that, dopamine, dopamine boosts our drive, it boosts our motivation, and it's also associated with higher levels of happiness. So these are kind of wonder chemicals, if you like, for knowledge workers like us. And the more we can stimulate the release of those magical chemicals in our brain, the more successful we can be in our careers.
Okay, okay. So I think, I think you kind of get it, all right? So what I'm arguing with you here is that for knowledge workers, for us to perform at our cognitive best, exercise is not some kind of luxury, it's actually a necessity. But what I can also hear, I guess, what you're thinking about is, oh, yeah, Jamie, this kind of all makes sense. Yeah, we get you, mate. But you've got a question for me. And of course, I get this question when I travel around the world and I speak at workshops and conferences and stuff like that. And what do people tell me? I don't have the time to exercise. And look, I get it because, look, I'm a busy guy too. And just like you, I'm juggling three balls constantly. And what are the three balls that we're juggling? We're juggling that one ball, which is our career. Because we want to be successful. We want to invest in our professional lives. But also we're juggling this second ball, which is like the relationships. You know, we're parents, we're husbands, we're wives. You know, we have families. We've got to juggle that as well. And then the third ball we're juggling, of course, is our passions, our hobbies, and our interests. And for many of the, us, of course, that is sport. But of course, when we're juggling these three balls, which is the ball that we usually drop first? Well, it's often the third one. It's ourselves and it's our exercise. So what I'd like to actually do with you now, what I'd like you to do is answer this magical question. All right? How do you make the time to exercise? And what I'd like to do in just the next 15 minutes or so, is I'm going to share with you, I'm going to give to you the keys to open that lock, to be able to juggle those three balls. And in doing so, to thrive not just in your professional life, but also to be healthier and happier too. So, what's the answer to this question? Are you ready for it? You should all be shivering with enthusiasm and excitement right now. So the answer is this exercise while you work. Now, we're talking about aerobic exercise here. And of course, as I said, the best kind of aerobic exercise is stuff like cycling and swimming and jogging, maybe even rowing. But I'm going to be focusing specifically on a particular kind of exercise, and that is cycling. Now, why is that? Some of the stuff I'm going to explain, you can do jogging, you can even do rowing, but don't try this stuff while you're swimming because you'll probably drown, all right? That's a very important point. Don't want anyone to die during work kind of life balance stuff. All right, so why don't we jump into it? Because what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to explain this to you, not while standing here. I'm actually going to explain this to you while riding my bike. And of course, while riding my bike, what am I going to do? I'm actually going to record that ride because I know many of you are on Strava. And just to prove to you I'm not taking it too easy, I'm going to record the ride on Strava so you can see my heart rate and my data and all that stuff. All right. So, What's the first thing that we need to understand, folks? The first thing to understand is that we have different modes of working. Now, some of those modes we do very much on our own. These are what we might call task-based working. And that can range from very easy stuff, like scanning our emails, reading a report. For me, editing a PowerPoint presentation that's almost finished, right through to more what Cal Newport calls deep work, really focused work where we're thinking deeply about a complex problem. Now, there's another kind of work that we're going to be talking about. And that kind of work for knowledge workers is super important. That's called learning. Because learning is about improving our skills, our capabilities, by studying stuff. And we can do that by reading. We can do it by watching a TED talk. We can do it by attending a course, an online course. And of course, a lot of these things I've already been talking about, we can do simultaneously while we're exercising. Now, of course, there's other tasks which we're not doing alone. We're doing with others. So here we talk about collaboration. Now, again, that can be really easy stuff. Like last week, I attended three webinars. And all of those webinars I attended on my bicycle. Because in those webinars, I was relatively passive. I wasn't leading, I wasn't presenting, I was there as a participant and a contributor. So I was pedaling away while being in that session. Now, of course, there's another kind of work that we're doing. Just to check in with you, my heart rate's now about 119, so I'm doing okay, not short of breath. Okay, there's another kind of socializing. And what is that about? It's actually a work task. 
Because as knowledge workers, a big part of what we do is getting things done with and through other people. So what that means is we need to communicate. We need to connect with people, not just in a task-focused way, but also in a more relaxed way. All right? Now, again, that can be easy stuff. You know, a couple of days ago, I was speaking to my colleague Ramandeep in India, just catching up for a chit-chat. But other times, two days ago, I spoke to my colleague Karen, who lives in France, and we were talking about a new case study that we were working on, but catching up on family stuff as well, but a bit more cerebral. So what I hope you start to understand, folks, as I've been talking you through these work modes, is that actually work is not work is not work. There's a spectrum in terms of easy stuff and more applied, more cognitive stuff. So not only do we need to understand that there's this bunch of different work modes, we also need to understand that there are different degrees to which we need to activate our brains. I better slow down, heart rate 120, that's okay, that's good. So when we talk about activating the brain, there's been some wonderful research done by a guy called James Hewitt at Loughborough University in the UK. And what James has written about is the fact that when we're working, we need to apply our cognition in different ways. There's very basic stuff, what we call low gear work. Now, I talked about scanning through my emails, but also we actually need downtime, relaxation, doing nothing. Now, why is that? Because we need to unclog our brain from all that busyness to relax. And when we do that, it enables, it opens up capacity in our brain to do what is called joining the dots. Right? That's, that's low gear. Then we have a middle gear. Now, what's a middle gear? Middle gear is kind of more actively engaged. We're not just reading the emails. We might be responding to them. We might be, for me, grading papers. Okay, I'm reading through the papers, but it's not pushing my cognitive abilities to the limit. I do that while I'm online. Okay. Now, the other thing here is that these tasks are often done in what we call switching mode, jumping from one little task to another. All right? That's that middle gear mode. Now, of course, in some situations, we really need to think deeply. Right? Now, why is that? Because we're dealing with really complex problems and issues. So when you're in that real high gear mode, you're drawing on all of your cognitive abilities, your knowledge, your experience, your education. And often you're not doing that alone, you can often be doing that with other people. That's really high gear stuff. All right, so I hope you're starting to understand it now, folks, because what I'm starting to get at is that work is not work is not work. And what I'm getting to is this. What we need to be able to do is essentially engage in what I've come to call in my research, matching. So you see what I'm doing here, folks. I'm just cruising along, 140 watts power, heart rate of 120, and I'm giving a keynote speech at the same time. You see, it's possible. Because keynote speaking is what I do for a living. It comes naturally to me. And by the way, I've rehearsed this talk quite a lot before getting on my bike. So for me, in a way, you could say I'm not in my highest cognitive gear, I'm kind of in middle gear. I'm cruising, I'm okay. And you can see how I'm doing that while exercising at the same time, right? So the thing about this is important because a lot of the tasks you do individually or in terms of learning, you can do like I'm doing now. And in fact, I do up to six to eight hours of work a week on my bike. But not just the individual stuff, also the collective stuff. So what does the research tell us? It's very interesting. I've mentioned to you a couple of times my heart rate. Now, why is that? Because actually, when we're doing the individual stuff, we can be up to 80% of our maximal heart rate and still learn from watching a TED talk or reading a report. I'll explain a bit more about this in a moment. However, in my research, what I start to appreciate is that when we get into that more collaborative or social mode, we're actually a bit more limited and more effective there up to a heart rate of about 60%. Now, you're probably asking yourself, what, what's this got to do? Why, why is heart rate important when it comes to matching your work tasks and the use of your brain? Well, here is something to explain that. Right, now, what I want you to do for a moment is just have a look at this slide. It's a classic description of heart rate zones. 
Now, how do you calculate your heart rate zone? For most of us, what we do is we subtract our age from the number 220. So for me, that would be a heart rate of somewhere around 170. All right? Now, that would be a maximal estimate. However, I'm a trained athlete. So in reality, I've tested my maximal heart rate, and that's actually around 180. So get to know your maximal heart rate. And then what you start to understand is for many of those work modes that I've described to you, particularly those work modes which require cognitive gear one and two, you can do those work modes right up to the mid-range of your aerobic zone. So up to 70, 75% of your heart rate. And you can still be productive, you can still learn, you can still develop, you can still work. Right? But there's a problem when it becomes social. Let me just see if I can demonstrate to you. Okay, so I'm getting my heart rate up now. I'm working harder. Now you're going to see what starts to happen. I start to breathe heavier. All right, it's becoming more difficult for me to communicate with you. Now that becomes a problem because I have to give a keynote speech. So I have to slow down. And it's the same in the world of virtual working. If you're in a webinar, an MS Teams or Zoom session, you don't want to be the person who's like heavy breathing all over everybody. It might freak them out. If you are like engaging with a customer and you've never met that customer before and you don't have the video on, they're going to think it's a bit weird, you heavy breathing over the telephone, over the, over the call. So don't do that, all right? So what's my advice there? You go up to 60% of your zone. Because look at that, I, go, I dropped my heart rate back now, getting under 120. And as you can see, I'm still exercising, but I'm absolutely okay to communicate with you again. I'm not breathing or slobbering, stuff, stuff's not flying out. Okay, so very important to understand that what you're doing is matching these zones. And as I said, for me, six to eight hours of work each week on my bicycle. That's a little bit more than half an hour a day that I asked you to exchange for the magic pill, but it's completely possible. Now, one more little thing is this. What we also need to understand is that in terms of that cognitive gear stuff, it's absolutely cool to be doing the zone one and two stuff, the low gear, the middle gear stuff during the exercise, like I'm doing now. However, when you really want to get into that high gear stuff, so for me, that's writing an academic paper. The best time to do that actually is in the hour to hour and a half after your aerobic exercise. Now, why is that? Because after that aerobic exercise, 20 to 40 minutes, the BDNF and the dopamine is released. So for those of you who are running innovation workshops, design thinking methodology workshops, the best thing you can do with your teams is get them on a bike, take them for a jog before you run that workshop. Because what you want from them is that high cognitive gear work. However, and I'm just going to flip back here because there's also a risk. You don't want to go right up into that high zone. You see, it's called the threshold zone. Because what happens there, now you think about that evolutionary psychology stuff. When, back in evolutionary history, would we be running to our max heart rate? It's like something's going to kill us, dude. We're in trouble. We're going to die. So actually what happens then is not so good because your body releases adrenaline and cortisol. You burn up your glycogen stores. And that actually has a detrimental effect on cognition. So after you do that really hard exercise, your brain's going to feel like mush afterwards. All right? So please, if you're running that innovation workshop, don't beat up your people with really hard exercise before the session. Just do the easy stuff. Hope that's understood. All right, so we're thinking here very much about this combination and how do we make it work. Some very practical advice. The first thing is this. You need to plan for it. All of us plan our work schedule every week. We have a diary, we have a calendar. And what do most of us do? We try to put our exercise in at 6 a.m. in the morning or in the evening after the kids have gone to bed. That's crazy. We should be scheduling it during a weekday, during the day. Because that's when we do our office work. 
and we can do the same here. But you need to plan for it, and you need to combine, as I said, the work mode and the cognitive gear you need for that mode with the exercise that you are doing. Now, the other important aspect here relates to the practical, practical stuff. So what do you see here, folks? What have I got? got my bike. I've got my trainer. I've got my tablet computer, and it's on a computer mount on my handlebars. Now, I can work away. I can look at stuff. I can watch stuff. I can talk to people. You need a little bit of investment. The other thing, of course, here is that you need a beautiful place to work out. Okay, now I know some people are suffering like hell. Why? Because their partner makes them put the indoor trainer in the garage, in the basement. It's depressing, all right? So I explained to my wife, my kids, it's very important that I have to have my indoor trainer in the middle of the living room, okay? Why? Not because I'm just a cycling nut, no. Because this bike is going to help me advance in my career. And if you people want that nice summer holiday, you want dad to pay for it, I've got to work hard, okay? So you've got to explain to people this stuff. All right, it's just not all fun and games. You're being productive, so they've got to make some allowances. Now, the other thing you'll see there, I put a few jerseys around me, a few motivational things, because that's about inspiring myself to ride. Now, of course, what you do need is ventilation. You see, I'm starting to sweat a bit now. Not because I'm working real hard, heart rate 120. It's because we're in a really hot studio here, and I'm not allowed to turn on my fan because it'll mess up the audio. But you need some ventilation, and of course, what you also need is a drink. You need to make sure the bottle is open when you take that drink. Okay, all right, so, very important on the practical stuff, okay? Set up your workspace, because what it is is a workspace. You invest in a nice desk, an office chair, computer, you also need to invest a little bit in this. And hopefully, you can recharge that to your boss as a business expense, as I have done. Okay, next tip. All right, what are we talking about here? All right, number one is you're a successful professional. And why have you been successful as a, as a knowledge worker? Because you plan things. And it's no difference with this stuff. You need to plan it into your weekly schedule. What you also have to be able to do is communicate to people. Now, as I said, it's not just about communicating to your partner, your kids. It's much more than that. You've got to explain it to your boss, to your colleagues, and even in my case, my customers, because I do customer calls on my bike. Now, that also depends on something. It's about you and your ability to deliver results. Because listen, if you're cycling six, eight hours a week, and you're not delivering your results, you're not doing your job, people aren't gonna be cool with that, all right? So be good at what you do. Deliver results, and when you deliver results, in my experience, you get much more autonomy and freedom to work in the way that you want to work. Now, there's also something very special here, which is this. You probably suspect that I'm not normal, all right? I'm not normal, okay? I know I'm not normal, why? Because I do this stuff. And a lot of people think that's really weird. A lot of people say, what are you doing? That's not allowed. Exactly. A big theme of today, inspiring you in the cloud, is new ways of working. And all I'm showing you folks is a new way of working that is 100% backed up by the academic research that it enables us to be productive, to be creative, and to innovate. Now, the last thing is this, is if you love it, if you get good at it, set yourself some goals. This jersey that I'm wearing, this is a European Masters Champions jersey. Those medals you see on the screen, I won UCI World Series cycling events. Now, how did I do that? I did that by thinking creatively about how I juggle those three balls of my work, my family and my relationships, and the passion I have for my sport. So if that inspires you, then absolutely connect with me. Check out this ride on Strava, it will be there. I have a YouTube channel called This Cycling Life, where I talk about all these work-life balance topics. And of course, I'm also on LinkedIn, 
where I share my research and the latest advances in this field. So my last message to you is this, just do it. Thank you very much.